Good evening, everybody. こんばんは。Uh, thank you very much for coming out of such a rainy day.、Um, tonight, we are proud to present two lecturers from Brigham Young University, Professor Ali Howell, who teaches comp compliant mechanisms, and Professor David Morgan, who teaches industrial de design. As a matter of fact, our current exhibition, Folding the Future Theoretical Origami Devices, came directly from Brigham Young University. These items displayed in the gallery were mostly developed by two groups by, at BYU, the Compliant Mechanism Research Group and the Wasatch Design Collective. <clears throat> you can learn more about these devices, which were developed at BYU from the book called Why Origami, published by the American Mathematical Society. But you are here for a lecture on origami, and I'm talking about compliant mechanisms and industry design. I understand that principles of mechanical engineering or design are applied to a wide, wide variety of things that we use, but I myself am not sure how the、uh, ancient art of origami has anything to do with this cutting edge engineering or compliant mechanism or industrial design. The good news is, we have just the team to explain the relationship to us. Before I give stage over the tonight accomplished lecturers, on behalf of the DICC staff, I would like to、uh, give uh, our gratitude to Patsy Van Iverson from the、uh, Gabriela and Paul Rosenbaum Foundation. Without our support and the funders' generous contributions, We will not have、uh, had such an eye opening exhibition and tonight's guest, guest lecturers. Thank you, Ms. Wang、uh, uh, Iverson. So, now, without further ado,、uh, please welcome Professor Lo Larry Howell and Professor David Morgan. Thank you, Minister Shimada. Thank you.、Uh, this is a, a very nice honor for us to be here、uh, tonight. And I'、uh, also like to thank uh, Mr. Atsui、uh, uh, Awe for his,、uh, all of his work in getting the exhibition prepared, and also Dr. Patsy Wong Iverson for,、uh, and the support of the Rosenbaum Foundation and the National Science Foundation and Air Force Office of Scientific Research. And NASA and others for their、uh, support of the research we're going to talk about. But it's okay. So,、uh, this idea of, of combining art and engineering, what an interesting sort of thing. It's kind of a combination of, of this that gives us some surprising results that we're going to、uh, talk about here. And it also should open our minds to all kinds of different things that we might do when we make these kinds of connections. Because chances are, when you think of origami, you think of something like this, right? You think of a crane or something you folded as a child. And over the years, there's been this renaissance, this new、uh, development of expansion of origami throughout the world. One of the people、uh, responsible for that is、uh, Kira Yoshizawa. He's a Japanese uh, man that,、uh, that really helped、uh, bring this uh, uh, in Japan with more sophisticated, complex、uh, sorts of origami models. And also in this time, there's kind of a, an origami language that had been created over time that helped to be able to communicate origami models and designs across cultural language、uh, boundaries. And as you do that, you're able to. Uh, share across the world these ideas, and you see this、uh, big expansion of origami. And at that same time, or actually later as it progressed, there was also more mathematics that was starting to come in to be able to model、uh, this origami, and that made even more things possible. So here's an example this is、uh, a model by, called Mother and Child. You saw this out in the exhibition. And This is designed by Matthew Gong, an origami artist in our lab. And the mother is a single sheet of uncut paper. 
okay, only folds, okay? One piece, that means her hair, her fingers, her dress, everything is one uncut sheet of paper. Same thing with the child, another uncut piece of paper. So it starts to make you wonder if you could do that, what other kinds of things can happen with origami. So this is one of our colleagues uh, we collaborate with, Robert Lang, and this is his yellow jacket. So again, the legs, the antenna, the body, the wings, everything is single piece of uncut paper. And his organ, an organist. And so uh, again, one uncut sheet of paper. And this even has the feature that if you pull in the right place on an organist, he actually plays the organ. Okay, one key, but you know. So, uh, so you begin to wonder if, from an engineering standpoint, if you can do something this complex, are there other things that we might do that would, that would benefit us in products and engineering design? So uh, Dr. Shimada, or uh, Minister Shimada mentioned uh, my work in compliant mechanisms. Let me just explain what a compliant mechanism is real quick. Uh, so this is not a compliant mechanism. This is a traditional mechanism that gets its motion from hinges or pins, okay? So that's just a traditional mechanism. That's, if you're gonna make something that moves, you're gonna use hinges or bearings or something like that. That's just how mechanical engineers do things. But a compliant mechanism is something where we get our motion from things that are bending or deflecting like this. That's a compliant mechanism. And now, as we start to look at uh, some of this uh, the origami tessellation, and you start to see these really interesting motions that we can get, right? And we say, uh, hey, that is really interesting. Uh, but also, that's a compliant mechanism, right? Because it's getting its motion from the deflection of the paper. I wrote a textbook on compliant mechanisms, and uh, this is how interesting that book is, okay? And, uh, and in there, I have this statement that says, a compliant link cannot produce continuous rotational motion. Okay, and that's pretty obvious. We don't need to prove that, right? I can't hook up a, a motor to this and have it turn because it just wrap around itself, okay? So uh, that's an obvious statement. Uh, but no one bothered to tell the, org the paper folders that that was impossible. And it created the Kaleida cycle. And tell me that's not freaky. Okay. Okay, so you get this interesting motion that does provide continuous rotation. Yes. Sure. Yeah, that's he's asking. Pass these around. So this one's kind of beat up. It didn't survive the trip from Utah very well. So, so here's the first instance we see, see, oh, hey, maybe we could do things we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And we started into this research in, uh, in origami-based engineering. We're not going to talk a lot about the research. We're mostly going to talk about uh, the applications. But we will give you a little indication of, of why the research is important. And of course, one of my big fears of doing research in origami is that one day there's going to be a senator there and he's going to say, origami? You know, why are we funding origami? My, my grandchild does origami, right? So that's why I have to show you know, all the applications and why it's important to you. So, and so here, the uh, uh, first thing is the mathematical modeling is that we can look at this origami vertex. And a vertex is just where uh, these folds come in together. And in each one of those folds, we can treat that as if it were a hinge. And now I can, I can create a mathematical model or a computer model to, to create its, or to understand its motion. And in rigid foldability, this just means if I can find origami models that could work even if, they, uh, as, even if they were another material and I put hinges at the creases, would it still work? That makes it rigidly foldable. And then there's something we call surrogate fold. So let's uh, look at this here for a minute. 
This is all about trying to make things so that I can go make things out of things other than paper, okay? And here's an origami vertex, okay? And if I wanted to make uh, this out of another material, let's say something like uh, polypropylene, so it's an ancient thick polypropylene, right? There's no way I can fold that into that origami vertex. And so I've got to have a number of problems. And one of the things I need is this idea of a surrogate fold. So here's the, uh, here's a fold in paper, okay? And then once I crease it there, it has a bias. It wants to uh, uh, fold at that point. And here's an example of a surrogate fold, okay? So now I can take this. This is acrylic, which is a, uh, a brittle plastic. And yet, I can still, with that, get that kind of emotion, okay? And so we can see this example here. Here's a origami water bomb base, it's called. It's a, and it's rigidly foldable because I can take everywhere where those creases are, I can put a hinge and it still has motion. But now I still want it to be one piece, and so I can put in a surrogate folds at the, those locations that I get that. Another example is that kaleidocycle that we showed. Here's an example of polypropylene. So now I get this uh, with a continuous rotation but in a material other than me. Uh, that's what I'm using the surrogate for. And then here's a bigger version. Uh, just change colors and one of the elements here so you can see it a little bit. So now, going back to our origami vertex, we want to make this, again, out of this polypropylene, same diameter, but thicker. And I can put in those surrogate folds. And now I've got another problem, though, too, and that is that it's thick. So when I have this piece of paper and I fold it over, notice here that I have these other two layers that are trapped in between these outer two layers, right? Turns out in paper that's not a problem because it turns out paper is paper thin, okay? So now when I go to other materials, that's not the case. So I have to find ways to accommodate that thickness. So here is this, uh, but now notice I have this surrogate folds a lot wider than others, and it does that to accommodate the thickness. And we have a number of different ways of accommodating so now with those things, we can take something that has absolutely no business being an origami, origami vertex, but using those principles, we can, we can do that, okay? So that means, gives us hope that we can do other things. Here's another example. This is uh, Robert Lang's uh, elliptic infinity in, uh, in paper. You saw uh, there's a lamp of this shape and uh, in the uh, exhibition, but this is a uh, rigid material and then it has a membrane that it's used to be the surrogate fold. But it's interesting taking a rigid material and still be able to make it go into a crazy looking shape like that. Okay, so now let's get into the applications we talked about. So the first we'll talk about is uh, origami in space and has all the advantages we get from compliant mechanisms, plus can be very compact, which is important for getting into space, right? I need to put it on a rocket, launch it into space, it needs to be compact, and it can get big when it gets in space. And uh, some of the earliest work in this origami in space is actually done by the uh, uh, Japan uh, Space Agency, and this is an example of a uh, solar panel that, uh, that uses what's called the Mura Ori. And Koryo, uh, Koryo Mura is a Japanese uh, engineer and, and scientist that, uh, that uh, is known for this uh, pattern. And sorry, this is another one that's all beat up. But, but an origami tessellation that has a certain uh, motion that, gets, that makes it very easy to fold up. Uh, and then we worked with uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory with Robert Lang to create uh, 
a solar panel that can get 250 kilowatts of power, to put that in context. That's all the solar panels on the International Space Station combined and doubled. That's how much power we wanted to get. So it's a lot of power in space. To do that, it would take uh, 50 or 500 square meters. Put that in context. If that was round, it would cover five lanes of traffic. So you have to figure out, how do I get something that big into space? And if you're here early enough, you saw uh, our things on this. We'll see. But it also needs to go into a uh, standard launch uh, vehicle, in this case, the Atlas V rocket. Here's our prototype. This One of these is on display in the, in the exhibition. And this is us unfolding it. Notice that hole in the middle. And it expands out. This is a 120th scale prototype. And these are uh, fiberglass with a capton as the, as the backing so we can run the electronics on the capton. So kind of material these are flex circuits. That hole in the middle is convenient because that's actually where you put the spacecraft. And so uh, this is an animation showing that uh, deployment. And then. Uh, Uh, another, uh, and you'll see another space thing we did with NASA Marshalls out there. It's a pointer mechanism that can point thrusters or, uh, or uh, uh, antennas and other things. And it's origami bellows. This uh, again with, with uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And here we're protecting, uh, you, it's a combination of things. Sometimes it's protecting the equipment from the debris that would come from drilling on Mars or in their asteroid redirect mission, where they plan to go in, drill into an asteroid, and be able to pull it back to Earth, where you can do more scientific experiments. Many people suggest that maybe we sh the idea is to keep asteroids away from Earth, not pull them towards us. But you know, hopefully this will work out okay. And uh, and then here's a, a version on a Mars uh, 2020 vehicle, and you see these also on exhibition. If you look closely. On the one out an exhibition, you'll see where it looks kind of dirty, okay? And that is from actual testing for testing for a Martian sandstorm, which has very fine uh, sand. So we brought the actual one that we've been uh, testing. Uh, okay, so those are some examples from space. We say, well, what, what about here on Earth? How can we how can we help people here? And one of the things we can do is uh, biomedical origami. Uh, in interest of time, we won't show everything. We have some in spinal implants uh, and some that we've done at the microscopic level where they're so small, these machines are so small, you have to look through a scanning electron microscope to see them. Uh, it's used to inject uh, DNA into mouse egg cells and do genetic research. What I'm gonna show you today is uh, robot-assisted surgery here we're working with a company called Intuitive Surgical that does the Da Vinci surgical robot. And so here a surgeon is actually remotely running this uh, device and can do some, some complex surgeries that she might not be able to do on her own, right? As you can use this to do things uh, that are quite complex and small and intricate. But one of the things they wanted to do is on a new robot was to be able to run a catheter down someone's throat, but do it with a robot. And the challenge with that is a catheter is very flexible. If you've ever pushed, uh, it's like pushing on a rope, right? If you try to do that, it just it just moves out of the way. It just buckles. And so uh, uh, we worked on this problem to find a way to use origami. Actually, we were just finding the best way to do it, and it turned out the best way to do it was origami. Okay. And here we created this. Uh, this system, that's uh, it's more sophisticated than what you can see from the outside, but it has this bellows feature. But on the inside, it also has other origami features where even as this thing is expanding and contracting, that space there stays the same. So as I run a catheter through that hole, uh, those holes stay the remain uh, the same size, and it keeps the catheter from buckling. So here you can see the catheter coming in and out, and it's supported all along here. So this is another version. Of course, we have to make these biocompatible to be in the operating room. So there's another way 
uh, we've been working with them, and that is in minimally invasive surgery. So I remember in space, we talked about you need to be small to launch, and then you get out, and then you can be big. Well, in minimally invasive surgery, you want a very small incision, and then go in through that incision, and then you can expand once you're inside the body. And the reason you can do that is because they blow up your gut with CO2. Okay? It's like your butt wants to touch it. It's, uh, it's pretty intense. And so there's room to work in there. And one of the things we did was design this uh, device called the Oriceps, which is based on the origami chomper mechanism. Think of like a T-Rex mouth or something here. And this Oriceps, um, it also has an interesting feature that it can come into the body uh, like this. And once it gets there, it can morph then and be a ripper. I'm going to show you a little animation here. And this will show it in, uh, kind of looks kind of crazy, Toontown-ish, but actually surgeons use this uh, for practice with the robot or any kind of minimal invasive surgery. The next bit animation I'm going to show you is of a surgery. So if you're queasy, this is a good time to look at your shoes for a second. Because it's, it's an animation, but it's a very good animation. And uh, so you see the device will come in right here. It'll, ch it'll morph into the grippers. And in this case, it'll be moving an organ out of the way, retracting that so that you can do it for another uh, procedure. And this is uh, our device here. So you see it much smaller. This is the, the, is the state of the art. And uh, this is much smaller, which means also smaller incisions, faster recovery time. But also notice this great big long wrist on this one versus our very small wrist on this one, which gives us a much shorter turning radius. We don't need as much room in the body, uh, which is also a good thing. Then uh, one more biomedical application is a lens lift. If you wear contact lenses, you know what kind of a pain it is to get the lens out and eventually you know, get it in your eye. It turns out every time you touch contact lens, it increases your chances of infection. So if you can decrease the number of touch points, you can do that. So this is like a pop-up mechanism that helps us do this. Here we see an animation that just pops up. Uh, your finger can come right in there, grab the contact lens, one touch point. It's called lens lift. All right, so now one kind of surprising sort of uh, device. They wouldn't think of origami and freight trains, okay? Not two things you would put together. And it turns out that a freight train uh, a freight locomotive is basically a brick, right? Its aerodynamics were horrible. And the reason uh, you can't just put a nose cone on a freight locomotive is because you don't know if that freight locomotive is going to be the front locomotive or the second one or the third one. And so if it happens to be the first one, you'd like a nose cone or a fairing. And if it's not, then it has to be compressed. So here we worked with, uh, with a major uh, railroad company in the U.S. Uh, to design a deployable fairing for the front. So here's an early prototype shown at a small scale and the folding, and then this was in steel, hinges. This is uh, computational fluid dynamics showing the, how, you know, as we're analyzing that to get the aerodynamics right. And here shows you the scale. There's a person uh, uh, deploying a prototype on a, on a locomotive. And we can do that very quickly. And uh, there's $2 million a year in saving in diesel uh, for 1,000 trains, but this company's running 3,000 a year, which means they expect to save $6 million a year in diesel in, by using this. And we should start seeing these uh, uh, here in the next couple of years. And, but it's not just the diesel cost for the, for the railroad company. It saves that much in... Uh, emissions and everything, so it's also uh, kinder to the environment. So, so here's origami saving the world, right? So, all right, with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Professor uh, Morgan, who's a uh, colleague in uh, industrial design. Thank you, Larry. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting us to JCC. I'm a I'm a product designer. 
So I am going to show the consumer products part of the uh, part of the show tonight. Uh, my research group is called the Wasatch Design Collective, and we do projects on our own, and we do projects in collaboration with uh, Dr. Hal's lab. So first thing I want to talk about just just for a second is maybe tell a story. So maybe while some of you were learning origami uh, as a child, I was not. I was learning how to fold airplanes. And uh, uh, one of my favorite places to, to fold, one of the best quiet times I had was in church. Uh, I am from Utah. So this was the particular model of airplane that I, that I started folding. And I found that when I would fly that airplane, if it would hit the wall or the ground, the, the front was a point. And it would kind of mess up the point and you know, not very, not very good. So, I found that I could modify that design and make a snub nose version of it, and then the tip wouldn't crash. And then it occurred to me that I can actually make my own version of an airplane. So I was, I was doing this as a kid in church, um, working through different designs of airplanes, and I would kneel on the, on the ground and use the bench as a table. And one day I, I was working on, on, a, on a design and I, I folded you know, my 10th version of it and I had to test it. So it's in a space maybe twice as long as this and I stood up, I was on the second row, and I stood up and tested my airplane. And I watched it sail, it was awesome. It went all the way to the back and landed and then I realized <laughs> that everyone was looking at me. <laughs> And the speaker had stopped speaking. And I looked at my mother, and I could see that I had not made a good choice <laughs> that day. But one thing the paper airplane folding did for me is um, it gave me the idea, maybe not right then, but as I look back, it gave me the idea that folding is a way to not just make a beautiful representation of something else, but actually make things that are functional out of folding. So I'm going to talk about the a backpack. Um, this is one of my students, Shelby. And Shelby um, folded this paper. Oh, I have a pointer here. Yes, folded these paper models. And it's a tessellation. And she moved it into a, a cylindrical shape. And it makes this great looking thing, right? And she thought, maybe I can make some sort of bag out of it, some sort of thing to carry stuff in. And since students love to make backpacks, Another student saw this bag, and uh, he said, oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that idea. That's a really great idea. So he made a bunch of models to make it into more like a backpack. And he made one. He sewed up a prototype. He was a good sewer. And he made this version of a backpack. And the idea was that the tessellations would sort of smash around the stuff that was in your backpack and maybe hold it more secure. And also that the backpack might express what was inside your bag. And that kind of worked, but it was still pretty cool. So they went ahead with it, and he and, and one of his classmates decided they wanted to make, a, make it into a real thing and produce these backpacks. So they did a, a Kickstarter, and they were asking for $17,000, and they got $56,000. So they had three and, three and a half times their, their pledged amount, and they had $56,000 in cash, and then they had to make them, <laughs> right? And they said, Professor Morgan, how are we going to make this? So it was a great learning experience for them <laughs> to make these backpacks. And I have one here. I can, sh I can show it to you later. There's one out in the exhibit, but I have one here. So if you're interested, you can come up and see it. But. Uh, one of the special, the special versions of this backpack is the reflective version. So uh, I found, I wear this backpack sometimes, and I found that it's very reflective. And the tessellations um, scatter the light really well. You can, you can see this in, the, in someone's headlights. It's fantastic. So another project we worked on is uh, we tend to do, for some reason, we have our meeting at lunchtime, and we tend to do things that <laughs> <laughs> that are related to food. So we, um, we were talking one day, and one of my students, Joshua, had been working on pleats. 
just uh, simple pleats. So this is another way that we as designers sometimes work. We don't necessarily have the idea of the thing that we want to do at the beginning. Sometimes they'll just sort of play around with it. And it's serious play, it's, Im it's important play, but it's still play. And so he was just folding, um, folding pleats and sort of investigating pleats as a way to get familiar with them. And he said, what can we make these out of? And since it was lunchtime, we said, maybe, maybe this could be a cake pan. <laughs> And this is the pattern that he eventually came to for the cake pan. And here it is folded up. So this is maybe our second generation of the cake pan, actually. First generation had a liner in it, that, a silicone paper liner that would sit inside the paper pan. But this version is made out of um, special baking paper. It's specifically made to bake inside of. And it's made by a French company. And this one is um, biodegradable and recyclable. So it's pretty cool. We're, we're excited about this. We also made a few modifications here to constrain the top of it so it had less, less sag when you baked it. But we baked many delicious cakes in this pan to try to get it right. And uh, a few months ago, we were at the origami conference in Oxford. And um, we arranged for uh, uh, cakes for everybody who were there at the conference. So it was. It's a fun thing to do. It's good to, ha it's good to have fun. Uh, another project uh, a student and I worked on is folded felt furniture. So this is a piece of felt. This is five millimeter wool felt, 100% wool felt. We get it from a German company. And uh, what Brett is doing is he's masking these lines on this big piece of felt. And then we're going to saturate the felt with resin, with plastic resin. And the places where the lines are, we don't saturate. It, it masks off the resin. And the places where there, where there is no tape become stiff panels. So we have stiff panels. We have, instead of usually using, so we have a flexible material, we make stiff in certain places and have the fold line remain flexible. So that's what's going on here. It took us many tries to get it right. It was, it was really difficult to get the resin to saturate through the felt to the right point without coming all the way through. So 10 versions later, we have this one. And the idea is that it would come folded up like this so you can reduce the packaging. And there it is folded up. We have it in all kinds of different colors. And here it is supporting weight. So yeah, this was a this was a great project for us. This kind of construction and the felt. You know how wool felt feels really great. So this is a this is a popular item. Things we made. This this next one um, actually has kind of a sad beginning. I mean, we were meeting as a faculty to sort of brainstorm some things we could work on, and there you know been another shooting like there just has been. And we thought, is there something we can do in this situation? And we thought, well, I wonder if we could make something from origami that was bulletproof. Not something you usually put together, but that's what we did. So here, let's watch this together. Hopefully. Yep. So there it is, stopping a slug right there. Of course, we make lots of paper models. And uh, here it is again. We have to make it thick, like uh, Dr. Howell talked about. There's a thick folding techniques. And we're getting closer. We're refining our pattern in paper and also in a full-size version of it. We're thinking about how many people can fit behind it. and, and uh, here is the construction, so it's Kevlar with aluminum panels sandwiched in there, and then covered with the with, uh, nylon, nylon outer sh shell. And here's the opposite behind it. So 55 pounds. And the idea is that it fits in, it fits in the same space that a spare tire would fit in, in the trunk of a squad car. So I, per, you know, we were trying to get the weight of this thing down to 55 pounds, and well, actually below 50, but it came out to be 55. And the the Homeland Security 
the gentleman that we were consulting with, I thought, oh, I wonder how this is going to go. And when they lifted up the 55 pounds, they said, oh, this is so light. <laughs> this is so great. They've been lifting 100 pound things, so this was really great for them. Okay, so here's the, if you're, if you're interested in the things that you see here tonight, here's some more resources that, that you can find our work. So there's a Nova episode. Uh, I'm a fan of Nova, and I don't watch much TV, but Nova's pretty great. So um, there's a whole episode about origami, and some of our work is there. We have an app that's at the, at the Apple Store that we developed for an exhibition. It's an a app you can download. This is our book that Atushi talked about. It's, uh, there's some pages of it out in the lobby that you'll be able to see. So it has lots of the work that we talked about here tonight. And uh, here's, here's all the people that help us with our work. Of course, the students, uh, the National Science Foundation, NASA, uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research. It's pretty great to be able to be funded to fold things. So thanks to them. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Set up this cool question and answer place for us here. Okay, any questions? Okay. Your kaleidoscopy thing? Yes. We used to call that a cootie catcher. Oh, okay. We made, we made those in great school. <laughs> I had no idea that that's what we were doing, that that was origami. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the, you could, yeah, that would the, have the, the numbers on it. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, that's all I have to say. Okay, great. Fascinating. Thank you. Fascinating. Both lectures, fascinating. Okay, here. So when the author of the textbook made the, uh, made the uh, statement about the continuous rotation, the impossibility of continuous rotation, what had that author left out? What, did it, what, was, what was the, the thing that was overlooked? Okay. Well, I'm the I was the author, so I'm the I need a you know second edition of the book. I was know, trying so. to be kind. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting about that is it was something that just seems so obvious that it didn't need any mathematical proof or anything to prove it right. It's just obvious statement. And in the book, I was writing, uh, you know, this long list of all the advantages of compliant mechanisms, and then felt obligated to list some of the disadvantages. And so, uh, so those, and I, I think the, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of lessons there of making assumptions and uh, things that you know are not true. And I've had that many times in my career when sometimes something's just not working right. And I try to find a problem. I go to the first the most obvious problem, and most and then in the second most obvious, you know, potential thing. And and often when those things don't work, what it is is something that that I just assumed that I knew that was wrong. And uh, and I think that you know applies not just in engineering but a lot of things in life. So. Hi. Hi. That was fabulous. Uh, I lived in Japan, so I've seen amazing things there. Can you tell me where your biomedical things, are they used in hospitals in America or Europe? Question number one. Number two, um, the backpacks, are they sold probably in Europe? Are they sold in America also? OK, I'll take the first one, and David can take the second one. So uh, the biomedical, uh, I didn't show our spinal implants. Uh, we have a, uh, a total disc replacement that uh, is approaching, uh, uh, they're in the process of getting uh, clinical trials and, and then getting uh, FDA approval and, and things like that. They were going to do Europe first, and it turns out that the European Union just changed how they do what's called a CE mark. And it, and nobody knows how to get a CE mark any now, right now until they resolve things. But uh, so we're hoping you'll see that uh, on the market here soon. Hopefully you don't need it. But if you do need it, uh, it will be a vast improvement over what the other options are. Uh, the, uh, the devices uh, we did with intuitive surgical, 
uh, we've actually uh, licensed those patents to Intuitive, and so that's their property now. And uh, and you know we'll see how they choose to to use those, and uh, you know and that's up to them. But it's, it appears that everything's moving forward on their end. Uh, and the you know we have other things in the work that. You know, there are certain points where you know we have to hit to, uh, the, just how patent law is written. If you make public disclosure, then you lose foreign patent rights and only have a right to, uh, a year to file in the U.S. And so, there comes a certain point where we can talk about them and when we can't. But there's some other kind of fun stuff going on, including more spinal implants. So, okay, I'm not. Sure. Oh, this is working. Okay, great. So the backpacks, um, I'm. I, if I remember correctly, they sold them in 15 different countries. And uh, um, their initial run of the backpacks was so difficult to make that they decided not to make any more. They did make other kinds of backpacks that they sold that were different than this one. But it turned out to be, in production setting, to make this particular tessellation the way they did it was really difficult to um, you know, to manufacture. So you can find them uh, like in rare places where people sell them, but they're mostly sold out and hard to find. Yeah. Thanks for asking, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I guess, sorry, guys. I guess I'm first. Oh, sorry. I'll pass this over. Dr. Morgan, again, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation for both of you. Uh, and um, I have a question, especially for this bulletproof origami vest, if you will. I would imagine that even though right now you talk about it as a personalized shield, yeah. I would be curious as to whether that becomes an interior design feature, not mm. to be a prophet of doom, but it seems that most of these horrific events take place in a public place. Yeah. So what is the interest and or opportunities you see to implement it as an interior design feature in clubs, public gatherings, um, what kind of feedback you're getting, what kind of um, yeah. conversation there is about kind of catastrophizing the situation versus protecting. Yeah, I think both uh, Dr. Hal and I can speak to that question. So as part of our discussion in the initial stage of this idea, it was, uh, it was intended it, at least my memory is that we talked about it as being uh, used in a public situation, particularly a, a school classroom. I had seen a, a program of where uh, officers were going to schools and training teachers on what to do in particular shooting situations. And that's part of the initial concept is it would be used as a barrier stored in a, stored in a classroom, in a cabinet, or I don't know, somewhere that could be popped out really quickly. So I personally think that it could be used in lots of different places, and like you said, an, an, a nightclub or some other setting where in a situation you have a little bit of protection anyway. You know, it's, it's a sad thing to be talking about for me, but yeah, I, I think it can be that, yeah. Yeah, so we're getting, one of the things that happened is we did a, well, it was on the NOVA program, but then it was also a YouTube video that, that you know, usually we do an academic video and you get, if you get a couple thousand views, you're really excited. And that one got uh, over four million views on Facebook and over a couple million views on YouTube. And so it just, it was everywhere. And, uh, and so that it got enough exposure, we're getting a lot of, feedback and some of it was people in school, some of it was, uh, and uh, a couple that surprised me that I hadn't thought of were uh, hospitals and was one because they said this was an infant uh, ICU uh, facility where they say if there's a, a situation uh, you can't move these infants because they're connected, right, and you need to do something to protect them. And uh, the other one that surprised me was in corporate uh, uh, conference rooms, because you notice in a lot of conference rooms now that are made out of glass, and with an active shooter, you're supposed to run, hide, or fight. But you're in a glass room, you know, with one door, how are you going to run? Uh, you're in a glass room, how are you going to hide, right? And, uh, and you can't fight in the situation. And so, uh, so there's actually discussion of putting these 
in uh, rooms like that as well. And maybe I really like your idea of, of you know, an interior design is if you could also make it so it's just not obvious. I mean, you know, it's not infringing if it's, say, underneath the table that you could pull out or, uh, or even, you know, blinds that you pull down or, or things like that. So I think there's some interesting, we are trying to commercialize it. We're looking for a commercial partner that could uh, pull this off. And, you know, we're in discussions with, with people there, but we hope, hope that can happen. Take um, a couple more questions, and then we'll go on to the uh, gallery viewing. So. so how long has this origami-based engineering be been studied at BYU? Uh, at BYU, it, it started, I'm trying to think, you know, in, uh, when we published our first paper, uh, you know, we, we started doing some of it as uh, probably about eight years ago is when we really started to get into it. And then once the, the National Science Foundation started funding it, then it, then it really grew. And it grew uh, both at BYU and a lot of other schools. They funded, I think it was 13 uh, different uh, places to do this more technical uh, origami. And we just focused on stuff from our labs, of course, tonight. But there's also some really outstanding stuff that's gone on around the country. But, but yeah, this is we're showing uh, probably about seven or eight years worth of, of work here. So, you know, in terms of product design, there's been some real classic product design that has resulted from folding for many years. So it's it's not a new idea in consumer products, but I would say it's gained currency in the last eight years. You, you've noticed you see lots more folded or tessellated things that are on the market. So, okay, Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to know what process do you go through in deciding what ideas are viable? Do people come to you or does the idea rise out of things that you'd like to pursue? Okay, that's a really good question and the answer uh, is going to come two ways because that's one of the values of collaboration is because we approach these problems differently and uh, sometimes we approach them similar but we uh, I'll tell you our experience in our lab is we found early on uh, a number of companies coming to us having seen things in compliant mechanisms where they uh, said oh let's make something really compact and we want it out of a flat sheet and we want it to morph or merge out of that sheet Right, and it took us a while. They didn't come and ask us that way, but it was, but it was uh, different applications. We started to realize, hey, that's what they have in common, and then we realized, oh, we need to create a fundamental theory or you know fundamental knowledge around being able to do this, and then we made the connection with with origami. So it happened in our case. We had a number of companies coming to us wanting to do s those sorts of things. And then we found there's fundamentals associated with the research in those fundamentals to do things that would impact all of them. And then we have been able to do this. So university research, that's kind of what we do, is develop the, the fundamental knowledge and stuff. So it worked out that way. Yeah, and as I said, we approach lots of things from the play point of view. So we're interested in um, things we can discover through our hands, through making things, through experimenting with things. We have a project right now, we're working with a flexible LED screens, and we really don't understand them. So, you know, we do enough, but mostly we're just using the material and seeing what we can come up with. And once we make something that's working, then we can you know, develop it into a product, but we can really like to come from a standpoint of play. I'll just throw in one other thing. There's technology or a market poll where people come and ask you, and then there's technology push. And the barrier is actually technology push, where we say, oh, we can do all this cool stuff. What's a way where we can go out and change the world in some way? And that technology push is also really fun. So, so uh, next one is going to be the last one. Welcome to Washington. Um, I'm actually a proud graduate of Brigham Young University, right. so it's always nice to see what the alma mater is doing. 
And I'm interested to um, also extend appreciation to uh, JCC for hosting us here tonight and ask the question how you were discovered by the Embassy of Japan. Patsy, would you like to stand up? <laughs> So uh, uh, Patsy Way Iverson is, uh, I don't know how to describe Patsy other than she is a, a networker, connector, puts people together, and really makes a lot of the origami world work behind the scenes. And she's the one that, uh, that got us in, in contact. And so we're grateful for not only that that she did, but for the many things that she does in the origami world. So please. <laughs>